women have had a long history of participation in the media industry, but for all the women who earn their living by working in film, TV, radio or print, the majority of jobs are still held by men. Only about 30% of the positions in television and radio are held by women, and many of these are in the area of clerical support. Why are there so few women working in the media? What is it like being a woman in a male-dominated industry? Why is it important to have women in this industry? These are some of the issues that are about to be discussed by three women presently working in the media. Pat Walter is Australia's first female television camera operator. She has worked for ABS in Adelaide and is now doing freelance work. Julie Copeland is a radio broadcaster and producer on ABC National Radio Network. And Lena Keneva works as a television and radio journalist for ABC News. When most people think about camera operators, producers and directors, they generally think of the jobs being done by men. Yet Lottie Lyle, Isabel and Phyllis and Paulette McDonough were producing and directing films in Australia as far back as the 1920s. Pat Walters, you've been working as a camera operator since the mid-60s. How did you get into this job? Well, it was quite fortuitous that a friend of mine had loaned me a Bell and Howe camera uh, with, with which to take shots of the children. I have three children. And um, it was loaded with 100 feet of black and white film. And one very hot January in 1964, the fire siren went up my way and I'd been painting the dining room ceiling and had quite literally painted myself into a corner. And I think that this is when the uh, uh, fate suddenly took hold and uh, I just put the paintbrush down on the top of the tin, climbed down that ladder and picked up the camera, got in my old car and chased the fire truck into the fire. And about two hours later I emerged from it covered in smoke and twigs and feeling alive for the first time in my life and I thought, well, wow, this is what it's all about. And uh, a police officer came up to me and he said, oh, excuse me, madam, uh, what are you doing here? And I thought, well, heck, I've got to come up with an answer. So I said, um, uh, filming for uh, Channel 2? And I thought, well, now I've done it. <laughs> you might, uh, you know, try and um, to find out if fact I was telling the truth. So I put the film into a um, into a tin and put it into a taxi and sent it down to the ABC. And lo and behold, they used it. And about a week later, they rang me up. There'd been a light aircraft crash up in the hills, and four young men had lost their lives. And they said, uh, "Would you get up there, please?" And having um, shot that film, it was a, um, a very tragic situation and having come through it, um, that film went national, uh, the news editor at the time uh, invited me to join the star, uh, the, uh, as a stringer. Well obviously it was a great start. What are you doing now? Well I'm doing very much uh, much of the same thing and um, well here I'm um, using uh, a CP16 camera uh, on a tripod and I'll carrying it up the stairs here to a um, police press conference. You don't uh, need just any help No, there. no, I don't need any help at all. Uh, when I get to the top there, I'll be just balancing on one shoulder and uh, I often have to manipulate my way upstairs and through doorways. And um, this was with the Bell and Howe that I was speaking of, using black and white film again uh, at the beginnings of the Vietnam War. Mice, which of course women traditionally are very afraid of, apparently, um, and usually scream about, but uh, I've never been afraid of them. And uh, as you can see, the camera gear is the same weight as that being used by the males. Um, I've found that I often had to be going out on uh, assignments, for instance, for Cyclone Tracy up in Darwin, which was very devastating um, to uh, horse events, including uh, cross country and uh, adventure and creeks and wet weather and travelling in all sorts of vehicles, uh, helicopters, light aircraft, army tanks, trains, you name it, I've used all types of... Uh, so there's no discrimination there on sending you on a job? Absolutely no di uh, discrimination whatsoever. If that was required and I was the one available out, I went. Uh, bushfires, um, uh, Ash Wednesday would be um, the last of the many, many years of having to go to bushfires of all sorts. Uh, quite often dangerous and once when in fact I was trapped uh, in a bushfire and had to um, receive treatment to my eyes later on because it just got filled with smoke and dirt and grit and um, 
women also, and you know, this is meant to be too dangerous for women, uh, but then fun just has to act sensibly. Julie Copeland, you've had experience in front of the cameras with Shoulder to Shoulder, and at the moment you're producing for the ABC the book show, First Edition. What does a producer and presenter do on radio? Well, I must say, after seeing what Pat was doing there, it's nowhere near as exciting as what Pat's doing, but in its own way, it, it is indeed exciting. It, it's uh, a matter of keeping up pretty well with just about everything that's going on, much in the way you have to, and that largely consists of reading, talking on the telephone to people, finding out who knows what, the, the range, of course, that one covers is enormous. It might be having, as I am here, teeing up an interview about uh, the Australian film industry. The next day it might be talking about the Japanese economy. I might then have to go and uh, chair a debate on uh, the state of the Australian novel. The next day it might be uh, what's happening in Southeast Asia. It, it, it's just changing all the time, of course, and keeping up with it is, uh, is, is a high, you know, makes it a high-pressure job. I then, of course, uh, as I say, keep up with the reading myself. I might go down and interview one of the authors who uh, have written one of these books, or I might be teeing up a reviewer, an expert in the field, to um, to come in and record a review for me. And uh, therefore, I'm in the studio quite a lot of the time, either producing someone, as I am here, who's who's on air in this case, an interview about the Great Australian Novel, uh, and in which case I'm in the control booth, uh, making sure it's sounding good and that the levels are right and tightening them up where needs be and making sure they don't talk on too much and not becoming repetitive and uh, in other words supervising and producing that interview here I'm just looking at, uh, at the levels of the sound itself and uh, I have a, an operator in there with me who's usually a male by the way although we do have an excellent female technical operator but only one unfortunately so you're not on your own in the studio obviously no and of course when I'm myself in the studio as I am here doing an interview uh, I have to have somebody in the control booth. Now here, this consists of perhaps talking to someone overseas on the, in the studio in London, and so we have to have our headphones on so we can hear what the other person's saying, they're part of the interview. And here I'm editing the tape, which is what I largely spend my life doing, uh, editing out ums and ahs, editing out ordinary bits, and of course editing for time, because you often record a lot more than you use. I mean, you have, you have to uh, heavily edit your material too. But I have somebody to do that for me, I don't have to worry about that. No, we have to do pretty well all that ourselves. I mean, in theory, there are technical operators, but uh, I find it's better to do your own editing because you have more editorial control. You know, you, you know what you want. And uh, in that way, I think I like radio uh, more than television, although, as you've mentioned, I have worked on television. But uh, would, would you see that as a big contrast? Because in television, you do have uh, a lot more people involved having a lot more say in the story you're making mm. probably than I do. Well, in mainstream news, there are uh, far more people around you helping you for television, but I find that we don't have the time that perhaps in radio you'd like for research. We have that problem of um, having to rush out on the job when the news happens, and uh, so we're dictated to in many ways. Um, the day is spent um, talking to the Chief of Staff and asking him, you know, where we're going, what we're doing, and of course if something happens, we're out there doing it. Do you have other people involved, though, in, in the actual story? Who makes the decision in the morning which story you will do? Well, it's the chief of staff with consultation with the reporters. If you're a rounds person, somebody who is covering a particular type, then you'll go out where, where you want to. But um, here I've gone on a general story about the blood bank, and I have to do a radio interview at the same time as I'm doing a television interview. And um, I'm discussing with the doctor the types of questions he's likely to be asked so that I don't uh, give him something that he'll be completely unfamiliar with. And that's a technique that you pick up along the way. And uh, also here we have to carry out the technical side of the job, and that's um, the tricks of the trade, but going to making a television story far more interesting, a few more shots. There's always a public relations lady on hand, or a man, mainly men, who will tell you what's most important about the place you're visiting. Here we have a technician who's showing me the nuts and bolts of the blood bank, and I'm taking down lots of notes. I hope that'll be helpful later in the day when I'm putting it all together. How do you cope with the general pressure of uh, having to get those stories to air night after night? Well, the pressure of the clock is enormous, and hopefully, if a story breaks, it won't be five minutes before the bulletin. Here I'm about to do what's known as a stand-up, and the technician is deciding what will happen to the microphone. After I've packaged the job outside, I come back with the producer to discuss the type of where the story will go in the bulletin, how high up, how high down, and the type 
and the time I expect to get on the story. Not often do we get the time we really want on television. And you can see here the general support staff are working quite hard to a deadline. Uh, there are many women working in the support area group, as you can see. And uh, What about in your area, though? Would you uh, like to see that ratio changed? How many women do you well, have working uh, as journalists like yourself? About eight women at the moment are working on the road compared to about 30 men. As you can see, the coverage officer is a man too, and uh, he's got all the phones ringing all day long. And this is sort of the area where we edit the tapes now. You can see that I'm sitting with the editor and discussing what shots will go where. And um, it's the most important part of the end of the day, I'd say, making sure that we can make a product that's understood by everyone. And this is the sort of thing we see at the end of the day. Blood supplies in Victoria during winter are normally low, but with this latest aid scare, which originated in Queensland, the blood bank says supplies are now critically low. Pat, you've obviously done a wide variety of stories. What's it like to be the lone woman on this sort of job? Well, I'm a fairly friendly sort of a person, and I must say that I got quite a shock when I first went on staff at the ABC and walked into the cine camera room. Um, one of the senior cameramen there just suddenly had an apoplectic fit, and uh, he just said it was a disgrace to the profession to have a woman in the cine camera room, and I must say I had a typically female a response to that where I felt quite tearful but didn't show it. And I went to my desk and um, started to prepare my uh, camera. And one of the other cameramen came up to me and said, well, Pat, uh, look, just forget about it. Uh, just show them you can do the job. And I felt great. I'm getting support. So that was all I needed. And I just got on there and, and did a professional job. And I found it was worked out all right from then on. What do you think it would be that would discourage women to stay out of camera work? Well, uh, I haven't found, personally, a great many women who've been interested. They've come up to me and said, oh, great, it's nice to see a woman in there, but, oh, I couldn't do it. Uh, so I would say to young uh, women, particularly young girls coming out of the secondary schools, that if they are truly interested in this area, then they should start informing themselves right away, that they should go to the stations and they should apply for uh, work observation and uh, to see what it's all about and start talking to people and use their own initiative. Would you have found it any easier to have more women working with you back in the 60s? Well, it would have normalised the situation more, but uh, for me personally, uh, when I came into it, uh, I hadn't come up with any problems as such because I came in very quietly and I'd more or less sneaked in through the back door, so to speak, and then it slammed shut. Uh, but I was uh, lucky to have a, a news editor who was pro-women and he encouraged me, and so it's really occurred on an individual basis. So I don't know how it would work for a lot of women. Julie, what sort of uh, response do you have to, to that sort of situation where you're working uh, amongst male dominated, in a male-dominated area? You've ha been lucky and worked with many professional women, but uh, what is, is the feeling in these work situations? Well, it's true. As you say, I have been lucky. It's not been through uh, good management, but through luck I have ended up working with a lot of good women, and therefore you've had that sort of support system and I haven't been as isolated certainly as Pat has but of course the same problems are still there I think uh, probably more so in the technical area though it would be nice to see more women getting into those non-traditional areas mm -hmm. and also at the area of decision making although I've worked with women our bosses have all been men and I think that's uh, that's why we can't really change things much until you have the numbers uh, generally while we are still a minority and I, I think uh, it's not just a matter of being a feminist to be a minority. I mean, women aren't represented, given that we're more than half the population. Still in uh, decision-making jobs, in, in sort of high-status jobs, we still are very much a minority. It's very hard to change attitudes. So you are working pretty well within the, the male structure. I did work on a, a television program, Shoulder to Shoulder, which was produced by women, in fact, and uh, the four reporters were women. But we suffered a lot of problems, I think, because of that. We weren't taken as seriously as if we'd had some men in there, just because people weren't used to seeing a lineup of women. I mean, they are used to seeing a lineup of men with possibly a token female, but when it's all women, uh, you know, that really throws people, and we found the male management uh, didn't take us seriously. So where are women going, do you think? Do you feel that uh, perhaps we're our own worst enemy working in the media that's so male-dominated, and can we uh, move into a much larger, broader area of the media? Well, I hope we can, and I think, again, it's, it's a question of numbers. I think when people get used to seeing more women in there, any kind of women, um, 
there won't be that sort of resistance. There won't be the sort of attitudes that Pat was up against at the, at the very beginning. When, when you are treated like a freak, you know, you, you do see stories still about the, the first woman sports commentator, the first woman uh, truck driver or whatever. You know, while there's only one, you're still going to be very isolated, I think, and you have to be very careful about the way you behave when you're outnumbered. Whereas I think uh, if there are more women in there, people will just get used to seeing women there and uh, then I think we can change something. While we're still a minority, I don't think we can basically change very much. Do you think the, the television channels encourage women to take up jobs similar to yours? Well, um, recently the ABC, in fact, uh, advertised um, for uh, people to enter into all the areas, um, sound, um, camera, etc. And uh, there were about 300 applicants. Uh, of those, 30 were weeded out and there were six women amongst those. Uh, and in the final analysis, none of them were offered a job. Now, I find it very hard to believe because uh, six, somewhere amongst those six, there must have been someone perfectly capable of uh, receiving training and uh, doing the job. So we still face the problem of when you yeah. answer the phone, they want us to they say, well, dearie, can I speak to the boss? Is that a, a situation you've mm. perhaps found? Oh, very much so. And I think uh, we only have to look at newspaper headlines recently. Geraldine Ferraro, the first, again, the first uh, female vice president of the United States, possibly. Um, and she is always referred to by her first name, Geraldine, and uh, instead of uh, Ferraro, um, because you, you'll see a headline like Mondale, chooses Geraldine. It doesn't say Mondale chooses Ferraro, and uh, instead it could say uh, Walter chooses Geraldine. But you'll still get women being called by their first names and men by their surnames. And I had an incident when I was in television where I went to Libya and interviewed uh, Colonel Gaddafi and Yasser Arafat and was the first Australian journalist to do so. Mike Willersey, who was also on the trip, didn't get the interview. And one of the headlines when I came back was Willersey scooped by a girl. Now, uh, at my age, perhaps I should be flattered to be called a girl, but I can assure you I'm not, because as I pointed out to them, if uh, that had been Richard Carlton or Peter Couchman scooping Willersey, it wouldn't have read Willersey scooped by a boy. So I think we still are treated differently, and yes. we're going to behave differently yes. while we're treated differently. Well, yes, I certainly come uh, up against a whole gamut of uh, reactions, even in one day, whereas my um, a boss will say to me, oh, well, you never falter when you've got Walter, which is a favourite saying of his. I'll go out and do a job at night, be a rodeo, uh, get up there amongst the Brahma bulls, and uh, one of the guys will say to me, hey, hey get out of here, lady, you make the place look tizzy. So uh, I'm confronted with this uh, extremes of attitudes. Well, talking about attitudes, what about the role that women put themselves into to get along in the job, you know, for instance, w the clothing they wear, the type of um, mannerisms they take on, on on the job. Is it something that uh, we can be ourselves eventually or, or do you think it will continue to be the role-playing situation? Uh, I think that uh, in any job we tend to appease all the time. Um, certainly back in the miniskirted era, I was wearing uh, a miniskirt and I was um, doing work with the army filming the exercises uh, that they were doing during the Vietnam War uh, and no doubt the dress wasn't appropriate um, because at one stage when I sort of ran for the helicopter and I was just ahead of the colonel I could hear him choking to death behind me because he was obviously getting a great view and uh, so I thought to myself well uh, Pat you better go out and get yourself a pair of jeans so for quite a while there I uh, wore jeans uh, and eventually went back to skirts because I wanted to feel more freedom and uh, uh, didn't want to conform. Well, you call it appeasement, I would call it pandering, and I think it gets back to us being a minority while mm. men are still defining our behaviour for us. You know, that if, if you're aggressive and assertive, you're, you're a tough bitch, or um, if, if either that or you patronise, and I'll pat you on the head and say, that was a good interview you did, sweetie, and uh, so you're a cute bird. I mean, we're either categorised as one, as the, one or the other. Uh, I've, that, that came up in a um, debate I was on, on television once about the women's movement and one of the women said to me in fact oh well you can get what you want if you want to I just find if you undo a top bot button on your blouse and flutter your eyelashes a bit you can get what you want and I said well, well yes you can do it that way <laughs> if you choose to I mean I, I think that's pandering but that is one way of operating I suppose and uh, again while we're still a minority we, we are there to please the men because they, they're the ones with the power. So that forces the question are we really taken seriously in the media? Well, I think when we behave like that, the undoing the buttons and fluttering the eyelashes, no, we're not going to be taken seriously. I mean, we have to be accepted as, as equals, as I think you're... I think it is getting better. I mean, you are now considered a very good journalist.
and it's not any longer you are a good journalist for a woman. The well, problem also occurs on the job where sometimes when the uh, women are out on the job, people ask for their autographs, which is quite a surprising thing to happen, that they would never have done it to the men. And uh, you might be covering a royal tour and people are chasing the royals everywhere. And in fact, they will come up to the reader of, of a, a network um, television bulletin and ask for their autograph. It detracts from what is really news when the public see the women in the media as perhaps the tokens aspect of the media and not really taken seriously. And it is very unfair too, I think, that getting back to, back to that appearance that you were talking about, that when we look at some of the men on television, uh, they're certainly not chosen for their looks, but still for women, if, if you're uh, middle-aged or plain or uh, your hair doesn't look right, forget it, you know, or if you're overweight, you're, you're just not going to make it on camera, I'm talking about, whereas uh, if you look at the men, that category doesn't apply. I mean, nobody goes on about what colour clothes they're wearing or whether their hair's cut the right way. Well, Pat might find it a bit easier because I presume that many women who want to become camera operators now are very comfortable in jeans anyway. Well, I would say so, but I think it really gets down to, never mind how you look uh, or your sex, it gets down to whether you're doing a good job, and that's what I aim to do. What about women in senior positions? Do either of you work to a woman who is in a more senior position to yourself? Julie? No, there, there are a couple of women now in uh, management and decision-making positions in the ABC. I suppose uh, the media is no different to the rest of society. I don't think there's anything special about the media. I mean, we don't see women uh, in top positions anywhere much. It's not no, just the media. No. And I think that has to change. Mm. Of course, I think it's sad that when women get into those position-making decisions, wh when, they, when they're in really high positions or high-status jobs, they're very careful to disassociate themselves from other women. You know, they can't really afford to be seen as one of the women. Mm -hmm. And they're, uh, if you look at some of the female politicians, very careful to disassociate themselves from or very careful to e not to even mention women, that uh, they are not supportive of other women below them. Well, how long before we do see women in these senior decision-making positions? Are they all coming up to a certain level and remaining there, or is there going to be a breakthrough soon? Well, I think that the attitude of the women to themselves has to change because I think that they personally have a, an opinion of themselves that they can only make it to a certain level and there's, then there's a cut-off and I think women have to believe that they can do anything they put their mind to and jolly well get in there and do it. Yes, I think so too, but uh, of course the attitudes have to change too. For example, for a woman to be married and have children has been considered and still is a disadvantage. And uh, the first thing you'll often be asked if you go for a, a high status job is, are you married, are you intending to have children? The assumption being that if you are, you're going to drop out or, or you're not going to take your job seriously. Now for a, for a man, it isn't a positive advantage to be married. He's considered stable, he's obviously married and got a, a wife who's going to support him and look after him and uh, he, he's going to be settled. Whereas for a woman, it is still a disadvantage. Now we all know women who've, uh, who've done both. I mean, we all know women who have had children and, and had their career and, and kept up with their work. Yes. But I think that attitude has mm. to change. In fact, you mm. have to be very careful, you know, to look like a, a dedicated career woman. It's better to be single. How do you think that government action at the moment, affirmative action and, and other areas of where women are in fact um, being helped along by legislation, what sort of effect do you think this will have? Sure. Well, I think uh, uh, it's a good idea in terms of it making it official, uh, the sort of ideas we've been talking about, mm -hmm. the attitudes we've all come up against in our work. I think if there is actually a law there saying hey, you know, the community now recognises that women are discriminated against, uh, that we are disadvantaged. Uh, it, it gives it a sort of public recognition, if you like. I mean, I don't think laws can, can basically change anything. Laws, in a way, reflect mm -hmm. society's attitudes. And yes. in a way, the media reflects yes. society's well. attitudes. It's, uh, it's not radical in, in terms of making changes. But we can now say, well, the government has recognised uh, all sorts of official bodies, the legal system has recognised that uh, women are treated differently. And so I think in that way, you know, yes. it does give it a recognition. But, I mean, that's opening the door, but the impetus still has to come from the individual, and you've got to be able to walk through that door. Well, it's clear that women are, in fact, making an impact 
both on and off air in the media, but it won't and it hasn't happened overnight. You can't imagine that, that tomorrow we'll be up there in the top positions, but women must work together. I think we'd all agree that's important, that we have to reach the highest levels of decision making and to ensure a balance of ideas in all areas. And for the men, there must come that change of attitude. The options are nevertheless there for the school leavers who are prepared to work hard and possibly harder than the men have ever had to work, not as a token gesture, but as a relevant and necessary part of that information system. Well, we all know that the media has tremendous impact on our lives, and you've just heard about some of the issues facing women who work in that industry. Women are playing an ever increasing part in this area, as they are in the general workforce. But for women to make major career advances, it's necessary for both women and men to reshape their attitudes. Women need to become aware of the work options open to them and should actively seek out careers in areas that were once considered the domain of men. A great deal of support has come from government policy on affirmative action for women and from such initiatives as the establishment of the Women's Film Fund and the Australian Women's Broadcasting Collective. I'd like to thank Lena Keneva, Julie Copeland and Pat Walter very much for letting us know what it's like to be a woman working in the media.